Welcome everybody to Kino Kunia Bookstore tonight. We have a very special presentation and treat for you. John Klassen with his Halloween based book, or at least Halloween themed, perfect for Halloween. Let's call it that. Maybe it's not an actual Halloween book. The Skull. Um, John Klassen is the creator of the number one New York Times bestselling, I Want My Hat Back, which won the Theodore Seuss Geisel Honor, that's Dr. Seuss of course, and its companions, This Is Not My Hat, which won a Caldecott Medal and a Kate Greenaway Medal. He also, part of that, in that series, has We Found a Hat, named as Publisher we Publisher's Weekly Best Children's Book of the Year. He's also the author-illustrator of The Rock from the Sky, and the illustrator of Extra Yarn, Sam and Dave Dig a Hole, Triangle, Swear, Circle, and all, all by Mark Barnett, and House Held Up by Trees by Ted Kuser. I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Skunk and Badger series by Amy Timberlake, and the Middle Grade Pax series by Sarah Pennypacker. He also illustrated a new upcoming book called How Does Santa Go Down the Chimney, <laughs> which is in collaboration again with Mac Barnett. So, he, originally from Niagara Falls, Ontario, John Klassen now lives in Los Angeles, but we're very happy to have him here today. So welcome, John Klassen. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to practice with my microphone here and hope my computer doesn't fall asleep. Can everyone see it okay? It's all right. All right. Um, we are going to talk about the skull today because it's the, n the newest one of mine anyway. And this was a different one for me. Uh-oh. Close my Photoshop down. That's work you're not supposed to see yet. <laughs> I was doing work in the hotel this afternoon. They're working me so hard at Candlewick. It's really... Um, this book was a lot different for me, though, in a bunch of ways. Uh, my picture books, um, I was very, very careful always to never narrate anything. I hate the sound of my own narration. It was the only way I could think to write was to eliminate it and just have characters talking to each other. But this story sort of needed narration. Um, and so I, I had to figure out a way to write it. Um, also, it was about a little girl, and I've never done a book about people myself before. I sort of avoid drawing people and thinking about people and writing them, they just seem impossible to me. And so I, I, I always liked doing animals because no one knows how animals are supposed to act anyway. And so however they act seems believable. Um, but because this wasn't really my story, I found it and sort of adapted it and changed it a lot. I felt more licensed to do that kind of thing. Um, here we can pull up the actual book though, just a sec. So the skull I can, I can run through the story as we sort of go over. We can do kind of a director's commentary style of it. In case you haven't read the book, you'll be able to go through it, but also I can kind of pause and talk about the different decisions that were made. Um, this is the very, very first page of the book before we even hit the title page. And I wanted something like this to preface why Otilla runs away in the first place. In the story, the original story, she has like an evil stepmother, or there's, there's a whole bunch of different fairy tale reasons and the variations on this story why she runs away from home at the beginning. But I didn't want to say any of that. I didn't want to go into it. I kind of like omitting it and seeing if, like kids sort of have an idea of why they would run away from home. They, they have their own ideas about that. And when you're little, you know, you think of running away from home because you didn't get the sandwich you wanted or something. Like you, you have all sorts of reasons, or you have much worse reasons. And like leaving those out and letting the reader plug into that, as soon as I did that, as soon as it said, Otilla finally ran away, and that was all there was, it drove the book after that for me, that we never find out why she runs away. It, it just gave the book gasoline in my mind because now we're curious about it, but we also want to know who she is and how she, what, 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 what did she go through? And the book sort of is about revealing who she is and maybe not necessarily specifically what she went through, but some of the depth of what she went through. And so then we go into the title page and she's sort of running through the woods. Um, <laughs> it always bothers me to show this title page with not in the book because the U on skull is extended for the gutter. And it's not, it shouldn't look like that. It's never, like, I was counting on it never looking like that. And then I realized I had to give slideshows of the book. I'm like, right, I have to explain that U. Um, <laughs> Typeface-wise, though, it is worth talking about. Um, I drew the letters for the titles, and then the rest of the book is set in Century School Book, which was very much on purpose. I use Century School Book a lot, but I was especially excited to use it for this book 
because it's kind of a creepy book and it's about some pretty big things. And Century School Book as a font is so friendly and open. And this, this, this book runs the risk of being sort of cold if you make the wrong moves and you sort of alienate your audience or you're trying to be too scary or too austere. And I wanted to be as warm as possible in the design so that we could be a little bit darker in the story itself. And so I really like mixing the fonts to something reader booky and warm and familiar um, so that we can go where we go in the book. And so th book design wise, initially I had thought of doing it all like this, all in vignettes that never touched the edge of the page. And then when we did it, we did the whole book rough like this. There were t it was just too many bubbles floating around in the book. And so the solution was to mix it up. Sometimes we go full bleed like this. And other times we do um, bubbles and things like that that are just sort of nebulous shapes. Um, but we, we, we meet Otilla sort of running through the woods. You sort of imply that she's grown up here and so she should know this forest pretty well, but right away the forest begins to look unfamiliar. Um, and the trees come closer and closer together. I was in um, Korea a few months ago now, and I met the translator who translates my books, and I'd never met her before, and she had translated the skull. And she, she, we didn't speak for very long, but she really, really wanted to talk to me about this section because it reminded her of and I had thought of this when I was doing it, but hadn't talked to anybody about it. The beginning of Snow White, the beginning of Walt Disney's Snow White, where when she runs away from the huntsman who said he would kill her and then decides not to, but says run away, Snow White runs through the woods in a way that disorients the viewer. She goes back and forth and up and down in a way that you couldn't track. You, won't, you don't even think that she's in the same forest by the end of it. She's gone through so many weird holes and portals and things that you would never hope to track her if you were chasing her. And I wanted something like that. She's running away from someone and something that's not too far away. How far can she get in one night? But because she finds a part of the forest that she's never been to before and enters some kind of a curtain that she doesn't even recognize, I was hoping to get something along that line where she kind of goes through some, you know, it's not explicitly said to be a magic portal, but it's visually a portal that she pops out the other side. And after she's popped out the other side, she begins to see brightness and light. And she sees this house. And I think that if you had grown up in the woods, you would probably know about a house like this, you know, a few hours run away. But she's never seen it before. And making sure that the kid reader especially wasn't going to be worried about that, the whole story, that, that the reader wasn't going to be, what if they find her? That she's not that far away, they could find her here. Trying to, as much as I could, protect this house and make it into a place that not everyone finds, that nobody finds except for her. Um, making that believable somehow is really important. Um, so she knocks on the door and, and this light is still sort of coming in. It's used when the skull shows up and then as she gets to know the skull, it brightens and brightens and that's useful because it's just thematically visually useful, but also it's just the day is beginning. And so she meets this skull up in the window. And um, in the original story, this part's pretty close, is that he makes a deal with her. That he hates rolling around as a skull. Um, it, it bothers him, it's painful, and it's awkward that he, that's how he gets to move around. And so he says, you know, you can come in and stay here, but the bargain is, that you have to carry me around and be my caretaker today or however long you stay. And that was too that was pretty fairy taleish. So he says that here, but it's not like something that, you know, she's being held to forcefully throughout the book. Um, and so he cracks open the door. And she holds him here. And the pacing of the skull after I sort of started getting into it, it's written more or less like a love story. It's supposed to be a love story. It's a very friendship, it's a friendship love story between these two characters. And so getting romantic with drawings like this, I hadn't ever done that before. My characters <laughs> don't touch each other ever. Um, but this was a different book. You had to believe that they were, they really like each other from the start, right away. Not because of something that they either, you know, do for one another. They don't prove their friendship or their affection. They just, 
it happens the same way as I think it happens to everybody. Without real explanation, you just have to sort of hopefully believe after a while that these two have really fallen for each other. Um, and so he brings her into the house and now it's, now it's very light. Um, this drawing's always bothered me and it still bothers me. I see it on a lot of the posters and the promo materials and I'm like, why did they choose that one? I don't like that one. I wrestled with this one for ages and I just never cracked it. There's something about the values that drive me crazy. I think it's that doorway under the railing there. That doorway doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know why it's there. There's something about that. This book, what I found out is that with every picture book, you don't like about 10%, 15% of the pages when they're done. You just, you're not going to. You didn't have time or you couldn't figure it out. And so that percentage, when the book is 115 pages long, stays the same. And that's a big, that's a lot of pages you're not as thrilled with, but you gotta live with it. It's gotta, it's gotta go to print. And so they go to these different uh, rooms. The skull shows her around. The trick with this page was that there's a portrait of the skull, or at least the man that he was, above the fireplace. And initially my clever idea was that the, 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 the border here was going to um, cut him off at the neck. But we had too many words on the page to do that, and so now it cuts him off at the feet. And the kids are really upset by that. They really want more drawing of that guy. But I've gotten... I've gotten some drawings from them already to, exp to show what he might look like, and that's been worth all the trouble. They go into the garden room. And this was something I added from the story. I added a lot of stuff later, but earlier on the story stays pretty close. But I added this in sort of a kid way. Whenever I would read stories like this, I always wondered what they ate. If she, if, if, you know, how, how do they live? If, if she... You know, already I think you're beginning to suspect that she could stay here, she's safe here, and what if she did? And this is sort of a weird, you know, not very nutritious, completely way, but this is a way you could explain how they eat. How does she live in a house with a skull? Well, there's pears that grow in one of the rooms. I like pears. Apples were too symbolic. Apples were like, oh, we're getting into biblical sim symbolism here. <laughs> pears, pears don't mean anything, they're just really tasty, and, so I, I, and I like pears, so we use pears. Um, this was always also the first time that like she feeds the skull and it just falls through him onto the floor And I can't remember if that was me or one of the old versions of it But either way it gets the laugh from the kids that this pear just falls through the skull and he still lo loves it He's very happy with it. What's funny to me is that there's no mouth on the skull I write the word mouth, but I've, I've never liked to draw as soon as I started drawing a mouth on the skull He looked like he was grinning and it was way too creepy and weird and I don't want him grinning because he doesn't always grin emotionally in the book, and so he just took his mouth away and that seemed to solve it. Uh, the masks... So he, he has this room of masks, and the, this wasn't in the folktale, but when I started looking up Tyrol or Tyrol or however you spell, there's different pronunciations, the place where this story is originally from, they have an amazing folk tradition of carving wooden masks, and they're pretty crude. Some of them are very involved, and some of them are really um, blunt and basic, and it, they run they run a huge range. But I, I got a book of them and copied them, and then that's these are pretty close. I mean, as close as I could get drawing them. But she she asks if she can wear them, and the skull says, "No, you're not supposed to wear them. I collect them. This is my collection. We leave them on the wall." And then of course by the next page they're wearing them. Um, and there's no explanation of that discussion. My idea, I mean, we, we have kids now. I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and I was like, this is how this goes, is that like, if, if they ask to wear the masks, they're gonna wear the masks. And also, he's a skull. He can say no, what's he gonna do? Put them on the floor, put a mask on. Um, what's he gonna do? Uh, and so then they go to the dungeon. And then I made the dungeon up, too. Um, but it helped a lot. My conception of the skull is that the man that he was was not a great guy some reason he's cursed as a skull in this house, and what did he do to deserve this fate? We never find out, but it helps to hint at what his life may have been like, and who has a dungeon in their house with a bottomless pit? And he, he says in this page, it's empty now, there's nobody in it now, but that implies that sometime there was people in here. What, what was he doing with a dungeon in his house? Um, and so it helped that idea. I don't get into it much in the book, but it does help that, that impression, hopefully. And the bottomless pit is very useful later on, and I just like a bottomless pit, so we have it here. Um, they go up to the tower. Um, a tall tower. And uh, I'm from Niagara Falls, as, as we said, and a lot of this book, visually, 
even though it's set, supposed to be set in Tyrol, which is out in the, in the Alps, in between sort of Austria and northern Italy, um, I set this book in my head at a very specific place in southern Ontario, outside of Niagara, uh, called Queenston Heights. It's against the Niagara Escarpment, which is a big, long kind of ledge that runs along southern Ontario. And in, in Niagara, there's a huge, long tower, very narrow, with the statue of General Brock at the top, who um, was an old army general in Canada. And my great-great-grandfather helped put his arm on it. It was always a story my dad always told me drove by. Your great-great-grandfather put the arm on that. Uh, it was probably everybody's great-great-grandfather put the tower on. But ours did too. And it, if you went when you were a kid, which we often did, it had a staircase just like this, a very tight spiral stone staircase. And, and they had like these deep set windows. You could barely, you had to put your head all the way in. And the whole thing was just so scary. Um, but also just the forest itself, the nature of this forest, that's, this is just Niagara to me. Um, this is just what the escarpment looks like. It's fallen trees and big rocks. The limestone cliffs are very fragile and so they fall down a lot. Big boulders fall into the snow and they just lean up against each other and stuff. And so I didn't really do a lot of research about northern Italy to do this. I just went back home instead. Um, and I liked keeping the architecture and things, by the way, sort of neutral. There's sort of a gothic arch thing going on, but very basically. I didn't want to get into, at first I bought a lot of books on, you know, northern, like, Italy, southern Austria, that kind of thing to get into it. But I just, I fell off of that. I wanted to generalize instead and keep this very neutral as to where they were and what her outfit is like and all of that. It's all kept very blank and that was, that seemed to fit my speed, I guess. It's all very uh, suggestive. And so they go up to this tower and they look out and uh, the skull sort of sets this thing up where he's like, watch out, this wall is easy to fall over. <laughs> to your doom. And like, what a strange thing to say. Uh, and, uh, and, but then, you know, he begins to ask, you know, you said you ran away. And she goes, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like, you don't want them to come and find you? And she says, no. And that's as much as, she doesn't offer anything else and he doesn't ask for anything else after that. And I liked this conversation a lot, that he just sort of, he lets it go. And she's, she's, she's not being difficult, I don't think. It's just that not, she doesn't want to get into it. Um, and then he kind of changes the subject. There's a big room I haven't shown you. And I invented this beat too. Well, this is all this is all new stuff that I from the old story. We can go into the differences in a little bit. Um, but they go to a ballroom, and uh, this was sort of the love story beat too. I really wanted to set up this thing where they find this ballroom. They talk about dancing. And they put the masks back on, and then they dance until it's dark, and it's just like, let's just go for the love story thing, let's just go right into it. They, they literally dance in the ballroom. Um, and it's just sort of this, this, this landing of a friendship. It's been a day of building this thing, um, and now we've landed it. And so that's the end of that part. Um, this idea with part three and then the words that describe the parts, um, I stole this from Cormac McCarthy and Blood Meridian. <laughs> He does it, and I always loved it, because you, you, it doesn't spoil anything, I don't think. If anything, it sort of juices you up to read the next bit. And when I did it, when I outlined it to see what words I could use, I liked every single, I got lucky every single time. They were cool words to use um, that sort of help you get into it and prepare you for it. So you're not, that was the other thing, is that it is kind of a scary book. And it turns out they read this to very small kids, like three-year-olds. And so if you prep them, if you say, you know, in 10 pages, a headless skeleton is going to somehow come into this, then it won't look like I'm out to jump around a corner at you. We've prepared you a little bit for it. And so now they're having tea. And she's sort of taking care of him in ways that he's said before he hasn't been able to do. He said he couldn't make a fire or have tea. And so here we are. She's made his life much better already and done both of those things for him. Um, but now that they're comfortable, and by the fire, he's like, okay, I have to level with you. You know, uh, every night, there's a skeleton that comes to this house and chases me around. And Otilla says, has it ever caught you? And he says, no, but I'm, I'm you know, it's, it's not easy rolling around, I said. I'm not great at it. So you have to help me with this. And um, Otilla kind of asks, you know, how often does this happen? 
and he says it happens every night. And I couldn't get this drawing quite right. This is another one I, de I never really quite signed off on, but she's supposed to just look really angry here. And I, every time I did it, she looked too angry and scary, and so I had to soften it a little bit. But she's pretty ticked off at this whole thing. Here she's run away from something unknown, but something that was bad enough that she had to run away. And here she's made this friend all day, and there's this thing that runs after him every night, and it's just like, it just feels like it's everywhere. Whatever she's trying to run away from has come here too, even though it's not literally come here. Something's up, and she just gets so angry that I think she kind of snaps here, or at least she's like, I, I gotta take care of it somewhere. Um, but we skip over that, or at least we kind of give her that moment, and then she, I like this bit, that after she's explained, there's a headless skeleton coming tonight, she's like, well, let's get some pajamas going, and let's... Let's have a nice evening, at least. He's not here yet. Um, and I like that a lot. I like that she's got the presence of mind and the self-control to not freak out, to just be like, well, we've got a few hours. Um, so she puts on some pajamas, and it's a very nice, you know, situation. It's not a scary going to bed. It's a, she likes the bed. She's never had pajamas before, probably. And so this is all very fancy. And, um... But yeah, the skeleton said we should probably get some sleep. The skeleton is going to come like pretty soon. Um, there is a series of books by John Belairs that Edward Gorey illustrated um, that are like these chapter books from the 70s and 80s, I think. And one of them is called The Mansion in the Mist. And it's about this kid who stays at this cabin out in this island in Canada. And he finds this wooden chest in one of the rooms in the cabin. And he goes into it, and it's like a portal to another world full of like druids and men who want to try and take over the world in some vague way. And they find him going back and forth, and they, one of the druids is like, I'm going to come for you like at your cottage, like in the real world. And he's like, no, no, you're not. And then later on in the book, he shows up and comes right up to the porch while the kid is there. He comes up to the porch of the cabin. And there was something about, I read it when I was little, and there was something about the, this, this promise that this guy said, I'm coming, and then when he does come, it's a shock, even though he said he was going to. And that I wanted to try and do something like that, where we've prepped you for it. We're saying, this skeleton is going to come. He's going to come soon. Um, it's almost the same as like in, in Rear Window, in Hitchcock's Rear Window, when at the end, the bad guy comes across you know, to the, to, the, to the apartment and comes in the door. And you've been watching him the whole movie, but for some reason, the fact that he's coming into this space to your home, as far as you're concerned, and that he's in the room. There's some horror about that. And you haven't done anything bloody. It's just that you can't believe he's in the room, even though you knew he was coming. Um, and so that's what we tried to do with this page, is that, like, we told you. Uh, he's here. He's opening the door. This is probably my favorite drawing in the book, because there's a trick that I really like here, where he's, the skeleton has opened the door. But if you look closely, um, Otilla has her eyes open. But she can't see him because the door is in the way. She's not looking at him. Her eyes are just open. And she knows that he's there, but she can't see him yet. And that, for me, is just such a scary kid in the room moment. That's how I remember being scared in the room, is that you're not looking at anything specific. You're just sort of awake. And who knows if the skull's awake or not? He's probably still asleep. Um, <laughs> I love drawing skulls over and over again. And then who knows what they're going through, but like, he looks exactly the same. Um, and so the skull comes in. This is this was one of the sort of the breaks in the book is that I don't usually do drawings that are staged like this. This is a three-quarter down shot with like perspective and some foreground skeleton. I don't usually mess with any of this. I usually set my books up so that there's no foreground, background, perspective, anything. But this felt like a bit of a break. We needed to do it here. We needed to really show up for this drawing. Um, and her expression was a little tricky too. She's scared certainly, but she can't get too scared because that's not who I think she is. She knew he was coming, but she didn't think he was going to be this fast. And so it took a minute. I'm still not quite sure I nailed it, but this is as close as I got. Um, and then it's sort of this like run. He repeats this line over and over again. And this was my addition too. What excited me about this book so much was that if we made this headless skeleton more of a robot, that he doesn't have any personality, he just screams this line over and over again. And there's no face to look at. He becomes sort of this perfect machine to take your anger out on later on. Like, we don't have any empathy for him because there's nothing to grab onto. All he's done is repeat a line. We don't know who he is. He's nothing. 
Um, and so this sequence of running through the house with him just repeating the line over and over again was lots of fun building that up. And they go up through the tower. They go through where we've set them up before. We've been here before, so now we know where they are. And she comes forward as he's repeating this line and just pushes him off the wall. Um, this was a tricky drawing because she's holding the skull here in one hand and coming forward with one hand. And then I had her pushing him off with one hand. And I was like, that's too casual. <laughs> One-handed pushes, that's really rolling the dice on this whole situation. She has to put the skull down somehow and then push him off with two hands. And then it was a better drawing. But for a long time, it was a one-handed push. And I was like, no, that's too risky. You can't do that. Um, and then they just watch him go. And then he just says, all right, time for bed, um, which I like a lot. I like that moment. And it usually gets a chuckle out of the kids, too. And then she brings him back, puts, his, puts him back to bed, and, and puts her coat on. And he's like, where, where are you going? We're done. We did it. And she's like, oh, you go to sleep. I got some stuff to do downstairs. <laughs> and I like this moment a lot, too, because I think he really does go to sleep. You know, he thinks it's over. And, she, and she's got this, this role that she has in the book of being his parent almost right away. You know, you go to sleep. I'm going to go downstairs and wrap some Christmas presents kind of a moment. Um, she does the opposite of that. But that's the feeling, is that, like, she puts him to bed, and it's really nice. Um, and I like this, this, of all the collections of words that make up the parts, this is my favorite, the bones, the fire, the pit. That's, I really, that, we got lucky with that. Um, she walks down the hill. She collects some stuff in the kitchen, which I liked a lot. I did, I can't remember where I saw this. There was a movie or a children's book or something, what was it? where this kept ha oh it was uh, my father's dragon my father's dragon if you know that series it's really good and what they keep doing over and over again is that like these animals will give this little boy like mysterious things they'll say like you need 10 oranges one toothbrush and a ribbon for this next day and he's like i guess i will have that stuff and then on the course of the story he uses them very specifically and it's so satisfying and you don't know why he gets them at first so this idea where she goes to the kitchen and gets a bucket, a kettle with tea leaves, a teacup, and a rolling pin. And like she knows why she's getting these things, but we don't quite yet. And then she proceeds to use them. She goes down and collects all the bones. Um, my thought with this whole beat was that like, if you're a kid, or any reader, that has any familiarity with how magical skeletons work in stories, they come back together. That thing is not dead. They're going to reassemble themselves. He was animated by something. He's going to be animated again. And so he's not quite dead, and so you have to really make sure. So she goes and collects all the bones. She collects every single one. She brings them to a rock. And uh, she smashes them over and over again until they're very small. And she does it to every single bone. And this was the, this was the, uh, this was what the whole book was leading up to, is this moment, is that like, her, her drawing again was kind of tricky. I almost had her cry, but I couldn't draw it. I didn't know quite how. She looks intense. She's got her eyes open wider than she does in the rest of the book because she's working something out here. She's extremely upset with both the skeleton and just everything about what he represents. And she's, she's got a moment to, to get it out of her system. And so she goes for it. I think that if it was, this was a movie, I would, I would try and see if she could cry at the end of this. Or, you know when you sort of do something and then you collapse and you cry because you're just so tired? Um, something like that. That's what we've got. And it's hard to draw. It's not my strength to draw those kinds of moments, but I tried. Um, <laughs> and then we go, then we just go back to her being a badass again. And then she, uh, she makes a fire. I almost had to put the mask back on here to really go for it, but I did it and I was like, ah, it's too much, it's too much. Let's, let, let's watch her eyes, I want to see her eyes, because her eyes are supposed to be cool again. She's over it now. And um, she's drinking tea that she made with the tea leaves and watching the bones burn to ash. Who knows how long it takes, but it takes all night. I saw one note that said, that must have been a pretty hot fire, bone doesn't burn for an ash. She's like, I don't care, man. I wanted to just go with the bonfire. It's very big and hot, that's what I said. Um, <laughs> And then she takes, we, we, we use the bottomless pit, she takes them back up, the whole bucket of ashes, and drops them down the bottomless pit. So she kills this thing like three or four times over. And um, 
what else do you, what other time do you get the opportunity to do that except for a headless skeleton that's just said one line? Like that's who you get to do that to. You don't get to do it to any other character. But I was so excited to get the opportunity. <laughs> and then she goes to bed and I think the skull is still asleep. Um, here. Um, and I like this drawing a lot. This, is, this was a fun one to do. And then part five is just breakfast. We're back to the pears. And the pears have been growing on this page the whole time. And now they're having a nice sunny breakfast and the, the skull, you know, is saying like, sorry for last night. It's kind of a wild one. And she's like, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's over. And, um, you know, he kind of wanders over to the window and says, you know, I wonder if he's ever going to come back. And I almost had a line here that said, like, Otilla picked up a knife and cut the piece of pear just to, like, really give her some edge, but I'd cut that out. And now it says, just Otilla cut a piece of pear, and she's like, it won't. He's never coming back. And then the, the skull just sort of moves on. He's like, it's a nice day. You want to go outside? And she says, yeah, let's go outside. And so they go for a walk in the snow. And, um, oh, it was such, this is a funny thing. Was my wife is from Orange County, Southern California. That's where we live now. And... She was looking at this drawing and she was like, I don't get it. I don't get what's happening. Why, why, did the, why does the sled not wipe away the footprints? And I was like, oh, honey. <laughs> because you're, if you grow up with any snow, it's, your foots are deep. Like, that's, this is what snow tracks look like over a sled. They're shallower. This is all, like, she, she thought, like, you should erase one of those things. And I was like, oh, we got to move back to Canada for a while. Um, but they do go for a walk. And, uh, and they're out there and she feeds him a piece of pear. And he He's like, you know, you could, you, this isn't bad, you could stay if you want. And then she goes, I, I'd like that. And so she agrees. And then we sort of end on the same little shrunken footprints that we started with, with her leaving the fence at the beginning of the book, but now they're much happier and there's some sun coming through. And then that's the end of the book. Um, well, there's an author's note also, but that's the end of the book. <laughs> Um, I have some really quick things to show, and then we can do some questions. I don't want to overstay my welcome here, but um, since a lot of these drawings were tougher, as I say, I don't usually get into perspective very much. Uh, I used a trick where um, I built little Lego sets and then drew over them. Uh, this is like I drew right over that. Like that's not even just a suggestion. Like I traced it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's really fun because you just get to like, you don't need much, you just need, because Legos are grids anyway, you just need a really a few pieces to do it. And then um, this was when she first meets the skull over here, she's looking up in the window, and there she is down there. I bought the little cloak on Etsy, you can get cloaks for Lego men on Etsy. Um, it's a happy discovery. And uh, I built a little forest out of just sticks and this block of styrofoam I got at a like a railroad model shop that they have. They still have those in California, it's very cute. Um, but my son was only like four when I started this book, and so we would go around on walks, and after I told him I was collecting sticks for the skull, for like a year or two years, he was like, sticks for the skull, whenever we go anywhere. He'd like, a stick for the skull! I'm like, all right, put it in the car. And I've got so many sticks for the skull now, it's great. Um, this was the ballroom, I think. Um, I even got fancy and put a light in the window. <laughs> Just to make sure I had my shadows, because I really I, perspective's never been my strong suit, and so I. I but it needed to be right for this. Like if it, if the perspective was wonky, I didn't want to break believability. There's some things that just for me was going to make it so that you you believed it more. And perspective just seemed like it has to have integrity. I can't make this into some sort of funhouse, even without doing it on purpose. Um, and then what else? There was an original, the original story where I, that I found, that was the only illustration in it. Um, it was a book called Ghosts and Goblins by Ruth Manning Sanders. I found it in a library visit in Alaska, actually, and read it very, very fast. I saw it in the table of contents, number six, and it was just called The Skull, and I was like, that's a great title. Let's read that in four minutes, and so we did. It was like, it's really like, it's very short. It's this long, and then that's the end. Um, but in this story, in that drawing in particular, I remember just thinking like, that doesn't look like a girl who agreed to carry a skull around a house without thinking much of it. Like, she looks way more scared than I would think. But the, the crazy thing that happened with this is that I read it in the library and put it back on the shelf and then went home. And I didn't, I don't adapt stories, so I didn't think of that. 
And then for a year, I just kept thinking about this story every now and then until I finally wrote The Librarian in Alaska. I couldn't remember the title of the book or anything, and I just wrote her and said, like, I read a story called The Skull in one of your books in your library. And in two hours, this was the scan she sent me. She found it. Um, but when I read it again, I had changed it. I had this, in this story, it's very, very different. She, um, this, this wrestling match with the headless skeleton happens in the bedroom all night, and then the sun comes through the window, and the skeleton just goes, poof, the sun. And then the skull turns into a lady who was beheaded a long time ago and gives the castle and a bunch of children and food to play with and eat to the girl and says, I'm leaving too, you've broken the spell and I'm off to heaven or something. And then she leaves and I, I, I had changed it in my head. I thought the story I read was the one that we made, but I still remembered mine that I thought I read and so I liked it and I thought, well, you know, there's a couple of versions of this story kicking around and it's not the most well-known thing. I think I have, I think I can do it. I think I can do the one I liked and that I apparently made up and that's, that's what we did. And so that's the book. Are there any questions? About any of this stuff? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, your question. Yes. Um, what would you primarily say your like, go to medium was? What would my, like, my, like the medium I draw in the most? Um, it changes. You know what's really strange is that it changes almost every book because I just want to mix it up and surprise myself with some happy accidents again. But I end up bringing it, the whole thing around digitally so much that they all look alike anyway. Like, I, I always think that I use some weird new material and I always think, well, this time I'm really going to use blue or something like that. And then, like, I read a book review, the book comes out and it goes, in this standard, you know, browns and grays and dust bits. And it's like, oh, it's not wrong. But um, <laughs> this, one, this one was mostly graphite. Um, Graphite and then uh, marker for the, uh, like the, the walls and the kind of the larger blocks of tone were marker, like kind of heavy, wet marker stuff. And then everything that wasn't that was graphite. And then the snow itself, I just threw dirt on the scanner and scanned it and then inverted it. Um, as much as I could use actual stuff before I process it, the better. And then, and then things like the light, which is all digital, that's just a brush, a digital overlay brush then those things don't look quite so digital, right? Because you've got so much crap on the, on the thing, there's just so much dirt and grit, that it gives you permission, I think, to do things like knock out her eyes and the skull digitally. Obviously, that's not a, that's not a painting part, but I think that the balance there between using just dirt and dirty things and then doing something really overly computer graphic on top of that is a nice balance back and forth, but there, I, almost every book I try and match the story a little bit. There's a book that Mac Barnett and I did called Sam and Dave Dig a Hole, and I used, um, at first I was thinking I was going to use inks and washes for that, but then it looked, the book is all about dirt and moving through digging dirt, and it looked wet, it looked like mud because I used inks, and so I thought, well, we can't, let's use colored pencil instead because that just, it looks like, it looks dry, and I don't want us to be thinking about digging through mud, and so stuff like that where you're choosing materials to imply something about the story anyway, but then you also, I just wanted to use colored pencils because I'd been looking at, David Hockney has a whole bunch of great colored pencil drawings, and I was like, I just want to copy those, and then I didn't look at them for like the whole year because I didn't want to copy David Hockney, but like, you're just like, I just want to use colored pencils, and so you just try and, you try and think of what's exciting you then, material-wise, and things you're wanting to try out, but if you can marry it, even in sort of a half-baked way to your story, it's usually the best. Yeah, yeah. You said a couple times that perspective is not maybe your strong suit. <laughs> is there something that um, is like just like really easy and comforting for you to draw? Like you might just like do a lot of work. Like a strong suit that I do have for drawing. <laughs> I think if I do have a strong suit, it's like um, laying things out. If that makes any sense, like organizing um, an image so that mostly in value, I think, like dark against light and framing, giving things homes that she is framed by the tree and in a mid-tone, but that her eyes are popped out of that. Like, that organization, that, that layering is my, like, seeing how those layers are gonna work in my head before I start, so I get really excited to, like, frame her head in this, you know what I mean? Like, just really simple layout stuff like that. I really like doing that and thinking, I can't even start drawing until that's organized, like, abstractly in my head. I don't like to work it out on the page. I just sit there and think for a while, like, well, I can put her in front of a tree, and then the thing, like, once that's figured out, then I can draw and then the pieces can be drawn and everything. So I think that I'm not great with color because I never studied color. I studied animation and that was all drawing. We never took color theory. And so when I got into illustration, I was like, oh, I don't know what 
color wheel does and temperature does. And so I always, I use color very, uh, I'm scared of it. I'm scared of color. And I, 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 it usually has a point. It usually has, like in this thing, the, the peach sunset has a dramatic idea. I want my hat pack red means something. I don't know how to use it in a cool, warm, dark, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. I usually use it dramatically in a way that calls attention to it for a dramatic reason. Um, and I don't, yeah, perspective, um, not great at that. I don't think that, I, I, I don't try to draw emotion very often, so I think I'm just rusty at it. But that was more of like a sensibility thing. I think that I really, I, I get excited by planning. The re one of the reasons I took the skull on was because of this image here or something like it, where it was like, here we have two characters, Otilla and the skull, who are both at really high emotional points in their life. She's run away from something horrible. He's been stuck in a house for who knows how long, cursed and alone. And yet, look at them. There's no emotion on their faces at all, and there won't be for most of the book. And that's what I always like to do in the books, is most of my books are like high emotional stakes, but no one's looking like anything. They're sitting in the park just freaking out. And like, that's how I freak out. I don't like look like I'm going through anything. I'll sit in the park and freak out. And to kids, I think that's really realistic too, right? Like, just kind of the idea of sitting in your class, just sort of losing your mind about something, you can relate to that and you plug into that. And I don't have to draw anything then. And it's, you're giving the audience work to do. And so that kind of thing, thinking, of, thinking ahead to my, what I don't want to draw, I think is my main strength. I think getting ahead of whatever I don't want to do, I think that's most of the work. For the skull, yeah. the question is whether have there been any interpretations of like the missing bits from the skull? Yeah, yeah, like people interpreted the story and like. Yeah, uh, um, one little girl, I think last week, said that she thought um, the skull was Otilla, was Otilla's skull, that she was meeting her own skull in the future, um, and that when she was being called through the forest, it was her own death calling her. Like, it, this the girl was like in kindergarten. Um, <laughs> like people say, don't scare kids. You're like, kids are so much scarier than us, you guys. They're way ahead. Um, kids are mostly interested. I didn't think of this for some reason. I left it out um, on purpose, I think, but I didn't think it was gonna get as much gas as it does. But all the kids wanna know, does the skull belong to the skeleton? Is that his skeleton? Whose skeleton is that? In one of the original stories, the skeleton belongs to this duke that beheaded the woman in the first place, and he was so mad about getting beheaded for that that he's just chasing down her skull to get her back, or to get a skull at all. But that just seemed like way too much exposition and backstory, so we left it all out. Most kids today, today in New Jersey, this morning, <laughs> this little girl comes up and she's like, she asked the question, does, you know, does, is that his skeleton? And I said, I don't know, what do you think? She goes, I think it is. But he, but you, but sometimes your body does things you don't want to do. <laughs> and so he doesn't want it back. And I was like, that's, I mean, you wrapped it up pretty good. That's about right. I mean, you said it, not me, but that was, yeah. But I think that's their basic gist. It's like, well, why doesn't he want it back? It must be that the body is against the mind. And like, I didn't want to imply any of that stuff, but that's where it goes. It's pretty clear. And so the interpretations are really fun. They don't want to, they don't get curious about Otilla's whole deal, which I like. I don't want to get into that discussion either because they're too distracted by this skeleton skull thing, which is way more interesting anyway to them. Um, so no one theorizes on Otilla's reasons for leaving or her running away, but that's as it should be, I think. Um, I have to write mine down, so I didn't mess it up. Um, this seems like a, a fairly natural progression throughout kind of all of the books that you publish up to this point. Um, but it's also kind of a big jump, and I'm curious if you, if this was kind of overcoming a hurdle for you, or if this felt like you were seeking more ambitious projects, I'd be curious to know how you landed here. So the question was, um, if this was a natural, if this felt like a natural progression to me, or if it felt like I was in over my head a little bit, or if it was, no, I did, that's part of, that's just me answering the thing, or if it felt like, um, like sort of, uh, this was like a natural step, or if it was, yeah, it didn't feel like a natural step. Um, my books were getting longer. The Rock from the Sky, the one before this, was almost 100 pages. And I was enjoying writing to chapters. Picture books are hard. Picture books are like 50 pages long, and they have to, like, one premise has to power you through that. And they're very difficult. And as soon as I started splitting the stories up into smaller chunks, even the picture books, I was enjoying writing to that break rather than writing to the end of a book. And so I wanted to do something 
also, I just remember I have very fond memories of like third, second grade starting to read at that age. And picture books are younger than that. And this book was for when I started remembering reading and drawing and, and writing. It was like this. I think, I don't know if I would have ever picked up my own picture books when I was little. I hope I would have. But I would have picked up The Skull because it's called The Skull. And, and it's also this size of book. This was the kind of book, this was the size of book I like to curl up with. And so in a very general aesthetic way, I wanted to do a book this size. But story-wise, it took me by surprise. The whole thing did. I just, as I say, I read it in the library. I didn't, for a year, I didn't think it was my thing to adapt a story like that. But then the more I thought of it, the more I was like, oh, I think I can do it. If anything, my impulse was to go simpler. I remember thinking, like, I want to just go, like, like, because The Rock from the Sky was kind of a complicated one, took a long time, so I thought, let's go really simple again. That's when I'm happiest. And here I am taking pictures of Lego in my room so I can get the perspective right. Like, I was like, I really didn't follow my gut here, did I? But, um, and so now I'm working on like a series of board books for babies that are like, now I can finally do my simple. <laughs> like, as a reaction, I, t I tend to do that, where every project is like, let's go in reverse from the last one in some way or the other. And just, because I'm just so tired of whatever this was, so you flip it and you go the other way. Um, Writing-wise, I was very stubborn about this one, too, because it's written in narration and there's attributions and quotation marks, all the stuff that used to scare me about writing. But I needed to do it to pull this one off, and so that took the longest, is figuring out what I sound like, it, like as a narrator. Um, by far, it took, was the hardest part. Um, the rule that I came up with for writing it was, you know, it's pretty straightforward, I guess, if you study writing, which I never did, but I, 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 this is probably week one, is that, like, the narration never gets very descriptive or emotional. It's very cold, you know. When it was dark, Otilla made some tea and a fire in the fireplace room. It doesn't talk about coziness, it doesn't talk about any... I have the illustrations to do that. This, the trickier part about this was that most of my books, the illustrations have a job to do. They have information to deliver that's not in the text. This, you can read out loud and they'll, they'll get it if you don't see the pictures. So the, 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 the job of the pictures in this is more subtle, but it's basically to do anything I didn't want to write description-wise. I don't want to talk about the mid the sunset coming through the windows or the dust or I don't want to talk about how close she holds him or any of that stuff. Or I don't want to talk about the mood, anything about the mood. I don't want to get descriptive. As soon as I start, I just gush. I just keep writing and writing and writing. And so the language of the narration has to be super cold. Even in the highly emotional parts, when she cries this bit, you know, Otilla lay down in the snow in the dark in the quiet and she cried. When she was done crying, she got up and began moving forward again. Like, that's pretty cold. Um, but we have to watch her. We have to watch the drawing. And the drawing has to be gentle. And, like, all of that has to work together. But it took me a long time to figure out how not to write. You know, she was sad and she cried. Don't write she's sad. She's crying. We already know. Stuff like that. A lot of chopping and chopping and chopping and chopping. So that was by far the hardest thing. I'm not in a hurry to do that kind of writing again because I was very tired at the end of writing it. And I think I like... The other ones are more natural, and they're just talking to each other, and it sounds crazy, and they're weird. That sounds like I'm very comfortable in that sound. This sound I'm not comfortable in, but I really, I was proud that I fought through it. I've got a question. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the books that you write with collaborators, particularly Matt Barnett, yeah. are very different, I think, in tone. Than, yeah. So have, how's your working process different um, between... between between the ones you do author yourself and yeah. the ones that you do with collaborators. The question is like whether how is the process different between authoring your own ones and, and being an illustrator for someone like Mac um, Barnett or any of the other authors. Um, when you're working for somebody else, like even for Sarah, uh, sorry, the um, I'll try and find these Skunk and Badger ones even if I can find them. I thought I had them in here. Um, yeah, the Skunk and Badger books. Uh, you're a decorator. I'm a designer in these ones, and I like being, I really love book design, and I like being a decorator. And I, I, my first jobs were as a set designer for films and things. I love sets and, and sitting in the back and letting the characters sort of do their own thing that someone else writes. But that is the job, is that you are, you're a book designer. And I, I do things that I, didn't, I wouldn't do normally. For these books, I got to draw lines, and I don't usually draw lines, and I really like my line, but I just don't give myself reasons to do it very often. Um, and so you get to, like, I get to be sort of like a weird, you know, cozy British illustrator or something for a day. It looks like this is my idea of what those books felt like. It was also, when they sent me these, um, there was these books that I had seen that had text like this somewhere, and I always wanted to rip it off. 
And I thought, well, skunks and badgers both have two stripes. I can use two stripes in the letters. That's enough reason to steal it. I'm stealing it. We're doing the books. And like, it was just like the text was a reason enough to do it. Um, with, 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 but yeah, you, are, you get to try out styles that you don't necessarily, like I feel very close to my own picture book style. It's got a certain specific thing. But uh, there's other things to, you want to draw, other things you want to try, and you're curious about your breadth to do it. And so it gives you a, a very low stress, low uh, risk way to do that. Because you can, dis especially with Mac stories, he's such a chameleon book to book anyway, right, right. that um, you get to disappear into something as much as he does, hopefully. In the, in the text, it says, like, from somewhere in his chest, which I imagine it just sort of, like, echoes out of the middle somewhere. Because um, it had to come from, yeah, I know, I don't want, you know, the top of the neck is gross, so I think, like, the chest, somewhere in the chest. Did you have a question behind? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like your other books that are more graphic and have no background. So yeah. What's your thought process, or like, uh, pro like I guess, artistic process through making books that are more graphic, flat, to more atmospheric? Yeah. Perspective. It's tricky. It took a long time. Um, this image on the cover was the one that I usually try and do one page that like nails the rules, and then try and remember what I was doing <laughs> for the rest of the book. Um, and this, the cover was the first image to that. Was like, how does this work? How does light work? What are the rules? What are the, are there shadows? Is it just light? Is there, is she rendered at all? Like once you once you organize those things, a big thing was popping her eyes out and the skull out, realizing that they didn't have to adhere to the rules of the rest of the look. Like they shouldn't pop, right? But I want them to because I want you to see her eyes. And as soon as I did that, then it organized the picture for me. For whatever reason, that was just like now I can do all sorts of stuff. Um, just the mid-tones all grouping together to the, the brick and the tree and that kind of thing, all of that sort of washing back and just being almost, you know, just a big blob of stuff. And then the snow over top. The snow over top helped a lot too to give it depth. Um, but just those, that just kind of weird fiddling and finicky stuff until it works. But rules like, you know, there's not shadows, there's shafts of light, but there's not a shadow over top of that. Sometimes those fall apart in the interiors inside the house. It got much trickier. The forests on all the exteriors were a breeze. They were so much fun, and I, ha I enjoyed every page. And then as soon as they went inside the house, I'd really slowed down. And I was like, oh, this is so much more complicated. There's windows, and there's chairs, and I didn't think of this in my calculations. And I had to make up some rules and break some stuff, I think. But the outsides were just a joy. It was as soon as I figured out it was just a mid-tone, some darks, and then they, her eyes are popped out. It was, it got, it, rules like that, once you figure them out, then you can just sort of fly. I kind of wish the whole book was outside. because. After that, it got tricky. Yeah. Um, now that you've explored something that's kind of a like dark subject matter, yeah. do you think you would do something like that again in the future? The question was whether um, we'd do more dark subject matter in the future. I think so. I've always liked edgier books anyway. It's all, like most of the books have death and murder in them already. Um, but this one really called it, you know, it's called The Skull, she's holding a skull. And I've actually really enjoyed how easy it is to pitch it. My other books don't pitch very easily. If someone asks me to be like, who, what, like if I'm on a plane next to someone, they're like, what do you do? And like, I make children's books, and they're like, what's your books about? Until this one, I'd be like, oh, well, I mean, how long do we have on the plane? Like, you sort of have to explain yourself, and it's hard to pitch. But this one is like a little girl runs away from home, she meets a skull in a haunted house. That's really fast and easy, I really enjoyed it. And so, um, when I was little, in thir the first stories I remember writing and illustrating were about a ghost, and I've been trying to crack up like a little ghost story for a long time. And there's just, there is something about leaning against the entertainment value there, that you know they're going to be grabbed. You don't have to grab them completely, the, the cover's going to grab them. The, the symbol of a skull does a lot of work for you before your work starts. And it's very fun, I've enjoyed it a lot. So yeah, I think I would, I thought of maybe doing a series where it's like the skull book and then like a book about a ghost and a book about a witch or something, and you do like a little set. Just a scary story, forest story, scary forest books, yeah. <laughs> like something like that. That just gives you a, a loose theme, but then you get to walk around and you know explore subtleties in there and hope that you pull it off. So I, yeah, I think I'd, I'd I'd like to. This book took so darn long that I'm not sure I'm up for another 115 pages for a little while, but we'll see. I hope so. One last question. Everybody. In the yellow over here, she had one. I saw it. <laughs> Um, 
It, well, from the story in Alaska, I think I read like five years ago. But then, like a year and a half after that, was when I th thought of writing the Librarian. And then I was doing like two or three other picture books, and so like. It takes a while to like noodle with the thing, and you're working on other books and stuff while you're doing it. Um, but when I finally said, like, okay, we're going to sell, you know, try and sell it, and so don't someone knows about it, and then I have to do it, that was probably like two years ago, um, two and a half years ago. I was finishing this book last summer um, over the worst bout of COVID I had, <laughs> just like fever, finishing the the stuff. But that was last summer, and that's so that was the ending of it. But then. Yeah, I probably started the, the like the finals, the October before that. So, but yeah, in, in production, quote unquote, like about a year and a half. From, from pitching it to publishing. From pitching, it was about two years to publishing. Pitching it to handing it in, and then publishing is another year after that. It takes about a year after you hand all that stuff in for it to come out. Um, and so, yeah, but pitching to handing in finals, final dot final dot final JPEG, <laughs> is uh, that's yeah, that's about two years. If you have any other questions, we're going to do the signing. You yeah. can ask them here, too. But thank you for coming, everybody. It was great. <laughs> great to talk to you. Thank you.